Welcome to the 12th chapter of the book of 2 Kings. Joash uh, becomes the king after the uh, death of Athaliah, who was reigning for, I think, seven years, a woman that reigned for seven years and was put to death by Jehoiada, the high priest, or a priest, and Joash was only seven years old when he took reign. And it begins now, Joash, uh, looking for two, right here it is, reigned, Vasilev's son. Uh, Vasilev is a king. Basil plant comes from that. Royal, reign, king, all these words related to Vasil. Uh, in the seventh year, of Yehu, that would be the king up north, put to death uh, uh, Amaziah and uh, the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah. And that's how Joash was saved by his uh, aunt, and he became king. They anointed him. That's all in the 11th chapter. There's more to the things of uh, Joash, if you go to Second Chronicles uh, 22, 11 uh, to 24, 27. We've already went through the book of Second Chronicles and because I wanted to show all of the things going on with the kingdom that related to the uh, prophets of Isaiah, Jeremiah, all the different prophets were during this period of time. And uh, I'm not sure on this period here. I think Elisha is probably dead by now. And um, I think I think I saw some things where I think it was Joel might have been living. You know, they're not. It's not sure. But uh, Joash is now uh, reigning, and the name of his mother was Savia, from out of Beersheba, which is down south in Israel. And Joash did the upright thing before the Lord. All the days which Jehoiada, the high priest, enlightened him. Jehoiada, let's go find out about him. It says Jehoiada grew old and was full of days. This is Second Chronicles 24, 15. And he came to an end being a son 130 years at his coming to an end. Boy, that's a long life. And they entombed him in the city of David with the kings, for he did goodness with Israel and with God and his house. Uh, he saved the kingdom, pro gave it uh, Joash to reign. And so he was uh, honored, entombed in the city of David with the kings. Now, he did the upright thing, it says. Only the high places uh, he did not remove. Now, another thing here, let's go down further. It says as long as Joash did well, as long as Jehoiada was in influence, but when he wasn't, it says here, this is what happened in 27, 24, 17. And it came to pass after the decease of Jehoiada, the rulers of Judah entered and did obeisance to the king. Then the king heeded them, and they abandoned the house of the Lord, the God of their fathers, which Joash uh, rebuilt and had him fix it up. And he, they served to uh, Ashtoreth, Ashtart, in the Greek Astarte, and to the idols. And there came anger against Judah and against Jerusalem in their trespass. Uh, and he, God, sent to them prophets to turn them to the Lord. And they testified to them. Prophets testified to the people, and the people hearkened not. The, to them, they, all these pronouns, which is kind of confusing, who's who. And Spirit of God was put on Zacharian, uh, the son of Jehoiada, the priest. It's his son. And he rose above the people. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, Why do you pass the commandments of the Lord 
that your way shall not prosper? For you abandoned the Lord, and he shall abandon you. And they assailed against him and stoned him with stones by command of Joash, the king, in the courtyard of the house of the Lord. And Joash the king remembered not the mercy of which Jehoiada his father performed with him, and he put his son to death. And as he died, that would be uh, the son uh, Zechariah, he said, The Lord, behold, even to judge, he'll judge. And it came to pass at the completion of the year, <coughs> excuse me, the force of Syria ascended against him. Now that's where we'll join up back here. But before that, only in the high places he removed not. And the people, excuse me, <coughs> the people sacrificed there and burned incense in the high places. Now I was thinking about this burning incense in the high places. Now, burning incense where God said to burn incense and what kind of incense was all determined in the books of Moses and Exodus, and Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And yet the people were burning incense otherwise. And I think about the mainline religions today that are basically burning incense. Uh, the Roman Catholics burn incense. The Orthodox, they burn incense and some other uh, denomination, I think some Anglican and uh, one Methodist and one Lutheran uh, church, uh, they, they, are, they burn incense. But there's no place uh, in the New Testament where it tells anybody to burn incense. But this is a practice by these churches, I believe, to perpetuate the priesthood, which is not instituted by God for the New Testament. We have direct access to God, not through a priest. So these uh, priests and these denominations, sects, put together these rules, and they have these sacrifices. And what they basically uh, use is uh, Revelation 5 and 8, and that's the only other place, except for uh, Zechariah, uh, Zacharias uh, going into the temple at the hour of incense, and the angel standing next to the uh, incense altar and telling him about John being uh, going to be born. But in Revelation, to only a couple places in chapter 5 and in chapter 8 does it mention angels offering incense, which were the prayers of the saints. But not priests and not people on earth. There's no place in the New Testament it mentions uh, burning incense. Uh, but yet they use these uh, few places in Revelation, which we had nothing to do with the priesthood of their denomination. And it continues, And Joash said to the priests, All the money of the holy things coming in as income into the house of the Lord, the money of the valuation of a man, a tax, the money of valuation of souls, all money, whatever ascends upon the heart of a man to bring in the house of the Lord, let the priests take it, uh, for themselves, every man from their sale, get the money, and they shall repair the breach of the house in all the places wherever a breach should be found there, something that needed to be repaired in the house of the Lord. And the money was taken by the priesthood. And I look at today, we have clergy taking the money from the people and spending it uh, for whatever they want. But here, this was found out. It says, and it came to pass in the 20th and third year of King Joash, the priests did not repair the breach of the house. And Joash, they spent it on themselves. And Joash, the king called Jehoiada the priest and the priests and said to them, why is it that the breach of the house was not repaired? So now Jehoiada, so this goes back now before his sons, before he died. And why was it not? Why wasn't this money used? It was given to the clergy, and um, and now, do not take the money from your sales. Don't and unto the breach of the house, uh, you shall appoint it. It's going to go for repairs. 
And the priests joined in harmony to not take money from the people and to not strengthen the breach of the house. Now, I'm not sure if that's parenthetical, if they didn't do it, but uh, 9, it says, And Jehoiada the priest took one chest and made in it one opening and put it by the altar at the right side of men entering into the house of the Lord. So he took, takes it in his hands. Instead of giving it to the clergy, uh, put it into this uh, ark. It's a, a box, a chest. Kivaton says chest. Same uh, word for the ark of the covenant, a chest. And the priests guarding at the thresholds gave there all the money being carried into the house of the Lord in this chest, apparently. And it came to pass as they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the scribe of the king ascended and the great priest, and they grasped and counted the money being found in the house of the Lord. So now they see that this money is being collected well. What did they do? They spend it on themselves? They gave the money being prepared in the hands of the ones doing the works of the ones overseeing the house of the Lord. So I, I look at the churches today that clergy, if they get the money, the head person, and he spends it whatever way he wants, watch out. <laughs> uh, n- not a good model. Here the model is somebody else taking the money, counting it, and then directly paying the bills rather than letting the, uh, the priest or the um, pastor, minister, or whatever he is, now, it's not set in stone to not do that, but here is a good uh, model of, of what way to do it. It worked. And they handed over to the fabricators of the wood items and to the builders doing the work in the house of the Lord. Uh, ergon, ergonomics comes from that word. And to the stonemasons and to the quarriers of the stones to acquire wood and quarried stones to repair the vedek, that is a breach, and that's a Hebrew word, Hebrewism, of the house of the Lord, for all as much as was spent upon the house to repair it, whatever was needed. Only they were not to make for the house of the Lord silver doors, nails, bowls, and trumpets, or any uh, gold item or silver item from out of the money being carried in the house of the Lord. So the money wasn't given to the priests to go out and buy things for the temple, but it was to be for the repairs. For to the ones doing the works, they gave it. And they repaired by it the house of the Lord. And they did not call into account the men to whom was given the money into their hands to give to the ones doing the work. For they were acting in trust. Well, I don't know how good of an idea that is. I, I, I suppose that if you trust that the Lord will lead the people to do the things, then that, that is good. But uh, there are people, uh, I was living in a place with this uh, woman who uh, went to church uh, with me and Christian, and there was this uh, periodical that comes out once a month, The Marketplace. And in the marketplace, it's all sorts of advertisements for different things, classified ads, selling things or services and uh, display ads and so forth. And in there was a man who had placed a uh, classified ad on doing concrete work. Well, this lady behind her garage needed a piece of uh, concrete to go from the garage uh, concrete to the asphalt, which was about six six feet, then the width of the house, probably 40 feet. And so, you know, then maybe something like that. So she calls up this man in the workplace, a Christian, believe everything is going to be okay. And he comes out and all of a sudden here comes a concrete tuck and it pours the concrete and it only goes two two thirds of the way. And he levels it off and leaves, never come back again. Uh, he got the end of a concrete truck. A lot of times, they'll, uh, concrete trucks will have big jobs, but when they finish it, they'll have concrete left in the, in the drum, and they don't want to dump it all out. It makes a big mess. You have to clean it up. So they'll, if they can find somebody else that will buy it and use it, then fine, and they can make money from that man, uh, which they did. But the man never came back 
and finished the job. So uh, giving, and she paid him. This was the point of the story. So, uh, you know, this giving, the, and just doing it in trust, okay. <laughs> but m- money for a trespass offering and money for a sin offering was not carried into the house of the Lord, for it was to the priest. So a separation of what was to the priest. Then Hazel, king of Syria, ascended up, and he waged war against Gath. Uh, that's towards uh, the Gaza Strip, I believe. And he was first to take it. And Hazel arranged his face to ascend against Jerusalem. And Joash, king of Judah, took all the holy things, which Jehoshaphat, his uh, grandfather, sanctified, and Joram and Ahaziah, his fathers, kings of Judah, and his holy things, and all the gold being found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and of the house of the king. And he sent them to Hazel, king of Syria, and he ascended away from Jerusalem. Well, Corinthians has a little bit different story. Uh, It continues where we were at. Uh, So, Right here, it has uh, uh, this force of Syria came against Judah and against Jerusalem, and they utterly destroyed all the rulers of the people from among the people and all their spoils they sent to the king of Damascus, Hazel, I guess. For the force of Syria uh, came with a few men, but God delivered up into their hands an exceedingly vast force. For they abandoned the Lord God of their fathers. And when with Joash, they executed judgments. And after their going forth from him and abandoning him with great affirmities, that his servants assailed against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest. And they killed him upon his bed, and he died. And they entombed him in the city of David, but they did not entomb him in the tomb of the kings. And that's where Jehoiada was uh, uh, entombed. And it finishes here, and the rest of the words of Joash and all as many things as he did, behold, are these not written upon the scroll of the words of the days of the kings of Judah? No, that's Second Chronicles. And his bondman rose up and made a conspiracy and struck Joash in the house of Milo, which is in Jerusalem, in the descent to Selah, whatever that is. And Eozahar, son of Semaath, and Eozavath, son of Samir, the bond, his bondman struck him and he died. And they entombed him with his fathers in the city of David. But see, it doesn't say, though, in the tombs of the king here. And Amaziah, his son, reigned instead of him. Now, chapter 13, we're going to go back up north to the kings of Israel, beginning with Jehoiahaz, and we will find out all the things that happen with this king. You'll find out if you continue with us in the next video seminar. Until then, God bless. Welcome to the fourth chapter of the book of 2 Kings. Continue in the life of Elisha. And it begins, And one wife from the sons of the prophet, Gini, the same word is used for a woman, uh, but only through context can you tell which one it is. And then sometimes it's difficult if you don't really know the idioms of the Hebrews and what situations it would be a wife or a woman. But I'm just letting you know that this is the case. Here, a wife, I don't think it would be, because this mentions one of the sons, one of the wife of the sons of the prophets, the prophetone. These were these men that were around. Elisha saw Elijah go up, and she yelled to Elisha. Elisha saying, 
You're a bondman, my husband. Uh, now, a man and a husband is also the same word, uh, anir. So you could say, she could say, you're a bondman, my, my man, but that wouldn't go because it's a husband died. And you know, so when just when you go through the Bible and you see these words for man and a woman, know also as a wife and a husband. And you know that your bondman was fearing the Lord. And the money lender came to take my two sons for a bondman to himself, a theo, a duo, because he apparently owed money interest, and they could take uh, your children to work for him, or be slaves, I suppose. And Elisha said to her, what should I do for you, or to you? Announce it to me. What is there to you in the house? And she said, well, there's not to your bondwoman one thing in the house, only a vessel of olive oil in the house of which I anoint with. And he said to her, Go, and you ask for yourself vessels from outside from all of your neighbors, empty vessels and not a few. And you shall enter and lock the door after you and after your sons, and you shall pour out into the vessels, and the one being filled you shall take away. Okay. She went forth from him and did thus. They've seen miracles by Elisha, so she is going along with his uh, instructions. And she locked the door after herself and after her sons. And they drew near to her to help, and she poured until the vessels were filled. And she said to her sons, Well, bring near to me a vessel. And they said to her, There is not yet a vessel. And the olive oil stopped. And she came and reported, there's a pingule, where I have mentioned the alpha and the gamma. Gamma here uh, has so many times, it has to do with, uh, it's a, from angel, a messenger, a message, here a report. Uh, she came and reported in the verb to the man of God. That's Elisha, calls him the man of God here from on for a while. And he said to her, well, go and render the olive oil for sale and pay your interest and you and your sons shall live by the rest. So apparently there was a lot of oil that uh, was made here. Now in our uh, list here of the miracles, we see the, uh, the multi multiplies the widow's oil, and I put the hall of the fishes. Um, there didn't have any, and then when Jesus came, he made them, allowed them to catch all these fish, giant uh, uh, hall of these fish. And came a day, and Elisha passed over into Shunem, Sonam. And there was a great woman there, a Gainee, you could say wife, but uh, a, a great woman. Now, she was a wife, but you wouldn't say a great wife. It's just that uh, in English, it doesn't go. And she took hold of, of him to eat bread. So he came by there, and it came to pass whenever it was fit for him to enter, that he turned aside to eat um, bread. So this, she was doing an act of kindness. A lot of women do. My mother made um, knitted things for the church, and women have quilted in Mennonite church I used to go to, and they'd sell these quilts and make money and give, them, give it away or help pay for the church expenses and so forth. And this woman here had a good heart, and she would feed him whenever he came by. And the woman said 
to her Andra, there's a husband, she didn't say man, husband, well, behold, indeed, I know that this is a holy man of God who travels unto us continually, he comes by. I know he's a man, holy man of God. Boy, who would know that anymore today? Um, I can't imagine anybody. Maybe he was dressed a certain way and did certain things. Men have done that for thousands of years. Clergy dresses in a certain way, or uh, even brothers in a uh, monastery, they all wear, you know, robes and so forth. They look holy. (laughs) And this man, now whether he was dressed differently that she could tell, I don't know. It doesn't say, but uh, it makes me think of people that are considered and looked at as being holy, and people will give them... um, perks, uh, extra things. And I don't wear any kind of uh, cloak or anything that would make me look different than anybody else, but some people know who I am, that I've translated the Bible, and they feel like, well, we're going to give him uh, something a little bit extra. And I, I see that doesn't happen very often, but it, it does. So that's what happened to this man. And she says to the husband, we should indeed make to him a small upper room, micron, micro, and we should put for him there a bed, cleaning, a recline comes from that, and a trapeze, on, tra- trapeze comes from that, a table, and a chair, and a lampstand. I went to the, uh, I owned a Patmos years ago, went over to Greece, ended up on the island of Patmos and was invited to go to the monastery to spend a couple of nights there and got to hold and see the oldest gospel in existence from the fourth, third or fourth century. While I was there, uh, they took me up to my room, a little room right next to where the uh, bells were that rang, and inside of there was a bed, a table, a chair, and a lampstand and a window. Pretty basic. And guests, were, they would stay there, and that's where I went. Reminds me of this story. And then she says, And it will be in his coming to us that he shall turn aside there, go into the room. And a day came and he entered there, and he turned aside into the upper room and went to bed there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant, Now apparently this Gehazi goes along with them but doesn't necessarily live with him serves him in different ways, and one way was keeping women away from him. Basically, he didn't talk to women. And they didn't touch him. He had nothing, uh, no re- no relations of any sort, sort of like the monastery in uh, on the Iona Patmos. The men and all the brothers sat in one place, and when I went there, two of the ladies from the group that I was with were invited and they came, but they had to sit separately in another room with the secretary of the abbot of the monastery. These men don't uh, have dealings with women, more so even here. And he said, that is Elisha to Gehazi, his servant, we'll call this Shumanite. And he called her And she stood before him. So he's sitting there and she comes in. And he said to him, Gehazi, so he didn't talk to the woman, say indeed to her, behold, you startled us with all this change of state, all these good things, this room and so forth is what she's talking about. What shall we do for you? And he asks, is there to you a word to say to the king? So here it shows that he is a very important person. He knows the king. Or to the ruler, and that would have been, I uh, believe, Ahab, or to the ruler of the force, a general, anything we can do, because he has their ear. And she said, oh, I dwell in the midst of my people. I, I'm just living. I just do my own thing, more or less. And he, Elisha said to Gehazi, well, what must be done for her? He looks at him. Gehazi said, well, that all means the son's not to her, and her husband's old, 
Presvitis, an elder. And he said, well, call her. And he called her. So he asked this after she left. So he called her and she stood by the door. And Elisha said to her, at this time next year, about this hour and living, you shall be holding a son. But she said, no, master, O man of God, you should not disappoint your bondwoman. And the woman conceived and bore a son at the same time, about the same hour, living, while she was living, as Elisha spoke to her. But things happen. And the boy matured, probably, I'm guessing, maybe seven or eight. He wasn't big because they carry him in mentions, but he was old enough to go find the father in the, in the form. And it came to pass, the boy went forth to his father, to the ones harvesting. And he said to his father, oh, my head, oh, my head. And his father said to the servant, well, carry him to his mother. And he lifted, so he was able to pick him up, him, and carried him to his mitera, maternal mother, and laid him down to rest upon her knees until midday. So he left early, and now he's come back, and he died. Kind of sad, isn't it? Uh, the woman didn't ask for the child, but yet God, uh, Elisha was given to understand that she would love to have a child, and uh, the miracle of the conception, his the husband being old, and uh, so she and she's frantic. And she's horrible that he dies in her hands on her lap. Can't imagine how horrible that would be. And she bore him, and she rested him upon the bed of the man of God. That's interesting. She didn't um, walk away, cry or whatever, but she took him and upstairs, carried him upstairs to the room and locked uh, the door after him and went forth. And she called her husband and said, send indeed to me one of the servants and one of the donkeys and I shall run unto the man of God and I shall return. And he said, why is it that you should go to him today? She, interesting, she doesn't tell him that the child died. It's not a new moon or a Sabbath. It has nothing to do with this man of God. And she said, peace, quiet. <laughs> and she saddled the donkey and said to her servant, you lead and go. Do not wait for me for it to mount. For if I said to you, go, then you shall go. She's upset and shall come to the man of God in Mount Carmel. And she went and came unto the man of God in the mountain. And now it doesn't say how long this was. Uh, I'm not sure. And I didn't look on a map. Maybe I should have. And it came to pass, as the man of God saw her right opposite coming, that he said to Gazi, his servant, well, Behold, a Shumanite. Now run to meet her. And you shall say to her, Is peace to you? Is peace to your husband? Is peace to the boy? And she said, Peace. And she straightened to the man of God in the mountain, and she seized his feet down on the ground, and she grabs his feet, and Gehazi approached to thrust her away. So same sort of with Jesus when he went to the uh, Samar uh, Samaria, the woman at the well, and the, when the men came back and found him talking to a woman, they were very surprised. So she frantically seizes his feet, hoping that he can do something for her problem, the dead child. And the man of God said to Gehazi, Allow her, for her soul is severely pains her, and the Lord's concealed it from me, and announced it not to me. I don't know what's going on, Gehazi. <laughs> and she said, Did I ask a son from my master? Did I not say, Do not mislead me? And Elisha said to Gehazi, tie up your loin and take my staff in. So apparently he knew she, he died. Your hand and go. And if you should find a man in the way, 
You shall not bless him, and if you, a man should bless you, you shall not answer to him. This is serious. You just keep going. And you shall place my staff upon the face of the boy. So he uh, knows that the boy has died. And the mother of the boy said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, shall I leave you behind? No, it wasn't enough that he sent to Hazy. So then Elisha rose up and went after her. He's now in control of the emotions of this woman, which a lot of men are. And I'm not, I'm not saying that's bad or wrong, just the way life is. Women can have an effect on men, um, if they're, especially when they're upset in certain ways. Ooh. And Gehazi went in front of them and placed the staff upon the face of the boy. And there was not a sound, and there was not a hearing anything. And Gehazi returned to meet him, Elisha, and he reported to him, saying, Well, the boy is not arisen. And Elisha entered into the house, and behold, the boy having died was resting upon his bed. And Elisha entered and locked the door after the two of them. Now, the two of them would be the boy and Elisha, or would it be Gehazi and uh, Elisha? I'm not sure. And he prayed to the Lord. Now, Jesus did the same thing. He went into the room where the, uh, the daughter had died, and only certain ones were allowed with him. I think it was James and John. And he ascended, Elisha, and Elisha ascended and bedded down upon the boy, laid down on it, on the bed, and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, this was just, he blew into his mouth with artificial with respiration, not artificial, what do they call that? When you breathe into somebody else's mouth to keep them, to resuscitate them. And his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands. And he bent upon him and warmed through the flesh of the boy. He was dead for quite a while, but she had to go quite a ways. And he returned and went, went about the house, this side and that side, walking around. And he ascended and bent down upon the boy seven times. Jesus didn't have to do it seven times, this whammo. And the boy opened his eyes. And Elisha yelled out to Gehazi and said, Call the Shumanite! And he called her, and she entered to him. And Elisha said, Receive your son. And the woman entered and fell at his feet and did obeisance upon the ground. Mm -hmm. It mentions obeisance in the New Testament. We don't do that any longer, do we? Muslims do. And she took her son and went forth. Now, this is not the last place we hear of her. Later on, um, Apparently, she, her and her husband leave because of a drought and come back after a period of time. And we'll find out a little bit here what happens there with that. Now, the next story, well, let's go up and I'll just see what, uh, what I came up where with uh, Moses was uh, the woman conceives. I, I thought about the woman's flow. He has con control over the body of a woman here. And Jesus, with the woman, they had the flow and touched the hem of his garment when the flow stopped. And Elisha returned to Gilgal. And the famine was in the land. So now we've got a famine going on. And the sons of the prophets sat down before him. And Elisha said to his servant Gehazi, Stand by the great kettle and boil stew for the sons of the prophets. Okay, so Gehazi's going to be a cook. And he went forth into a field, that is Gehazi, to collect together herbs. And he found a vine in the field, and he collected together from it a wild gourd to fill his cloak. And he entered and put it into the kettle of the stew, but they did not know. And he poured out to the men to eat. And it came to pass in their eating, and looking down from out of the stew, that they yelled out and said, Death is in the kettle, O man of God, and they were not able to eat. 
So it sounds like Gehazi was about as good a cook as I am. Uh, death is in the stew. I, I made some chocolate spaghetti. Oh, boy, was it terrible. I couldn't eat it. And I was like, I would rather have it be poison. But uh, this man <laughs> didn't know how to cook. Almost poisoned him. And he, Elisha said, well, you take flour and put it in the kettle. And they put. And Elijah said to Gehazi, well, pour out to the people and let them eat. And there was not a bad thing still in the kettle. Now, how it went left with a miracle. And a man came from out of, uh, so now that was the next, uh, the next one, a miracle. So, um, healing the dead, the dead child in Matthew 18, 26 with Jesus, heals the poison food. I had a hard time find, finding that, but I thought of the manna from heaven, which gives life to the people. God had control over the food. And then the next one, the multi, we're going to go in here, uh, multiplies the loaves. So the four or 5,000 were, were uh, fed by Jesus in the wilderness. And a man came from out of Valsalisa, and he brought to the man of God first produce of 20 bread loaves of barley and dried clusters of figs. And he said, give them to the people and let them eat. And his minister, Liturgos, a liturgy comes from that, said, what should I give before this hundred men? There's only a little bit of food. And he said, give to the people and let them eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave over. And they ate and left behind according to the saying of the Lord, just as Jesus did when they picked up the Rem, the leftovers on the ground, it was, I don't know, five or six bushels full of food. The next uh, video seminar, chapter five, is on Naaman, the Syrian general, and really interesting story. We can learn a lot from this. Hope you'll join us in chapter five. Until then, God bless.